So it's my honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Farrick, who is graciously um, taking the place of Sue Harbath. Dr. Harbath had to cancel, so thank you so much. Um, Dr. H Stephen Farrick is an associate professor of biblical theolo theology here at Kenrick Lennon Seminary and also a candidate for the permanent diaconate for the St. Louis Archdiocese. He grew up in Alton, Illinois, and holds a doctorate of sacred theology from Boston College. He and his wife, Nori, are parishioners of St. Joseph and Clayton, where Nori serves as director of sacred music, and Steve is involved in adult faith formation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Farrick. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very good to be with you today. Um, I am a somewhat last minute uh, replacement, so bear with me. Hopefully, uh, hopefully what I have to offer will, will, uh, will, pass the, will pass the test, as they say. So I've entitled my talk today, I Have Loved You with an Everlasting Love, Biblical Reflections on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Tomorrow, of course, we celebrate the solemnity of the Sacred Heart, and um, I thought it would be good to reflect on the roots of this devotion in sacred scripture. I've um, prepared a handout, and it uh, contains a series of quotations that I will be referencing at different points during the talk. So you can just, uh, as, I, as I read the scriptures, which I will be doing uh, shortly, you can follow along with the handout. I'd like to begin, however, by asking you to, as the case may be, either engage your memory or your imagination. Um, your memory if you are married, your imagination if you happen not to be married. So what I'm going to ask you to do just for a moment is if you are married, think back to the time when you fell in love and got engaged to your spouse. If you are not married, imagine falling deeply in love and being asked to spend the rest of your life with your beloved. Imagine, or call to mind as the case may be, the joy, the exhilaration, the anticipation of spending your life together as spouses and of bringing children into the world in order to form a family. But now, and this is an act of imagination for everyone, imagine after getting engaged to your future spouse, imagine God speaking to you in the depths of your heart and telling you, the man you are going to marry is going to be unfaithful to you. Not once, not twice, but repeatedly, over and over. Nevertheless, I want you to marry him, to have children with him, to love him intensely, and to welcome him back into your home and forgive him every single time he is unfaithful. Now, I don't know about you, but if the Lord came to me and presented this scenario to me as my vocation in life, I'd be very tempted to say, well, thanks all the same, Lord, but I'd, I'd rather pass on that one. Now, as crazy as this scenario might sound, one man was called by God to live it out. In the pages of the Old Testament, we meet the prophet Hosea. Hosea was a godly man who lived in a very ungodly time. He lived in the 8th century BC in the northern kingdom of Israel. And during that time, many of the people of Israel were being very unfaithful to the covenant that God had made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They were disobeying the commandments left and right, and above all, engaging in idolatry, forsaking Yahweh, their God, for the worship of other gods. In the book of Hosea, we read that God called the prophet Hosea to marry an unfaithful woman, a prostitute, in fact, and to have children with her, and to welcome her back into his home and into his life 
every time she committed an act of infidelity. This divine call to Hosea, this very difficult call to Hosea, is recounted for us at the very beginning of the book which bears his name. In Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, we read, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of prostitution, and have children of prostitution, for the land commits great prostitution by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Hosea was obedient to the Lord's call, and he did just what God was asking him to do. We can admire Hosea for his docility to the will of God, but at the same time, we might rightly ask ourselves, why would God ever ask something like this of, an, of any human being? Why would God ask someone to take upon himself such a torturous way of living? Well, the answer to that question can already be found in the words that God spoke to Hosea. And if we read the entire book of Hosea, the answer becomes clearer and clearer as we make our way through the book. At the very beginning of this book, God says to Hosea, for the land commits great prostitution by forsaking the Lord. Hosea was called by God to marry and remain faithful to an unfaithful woman in order to be a living and visible sign of the anguish that God experienced every time his people turned away from him and at the same time to be a living and visible sign of the mercy God showed to his people over and over in spite of their infidelity. This covenant people was repeatedly unfaithful to God, but God loved them so intensely that he would never reject or abandon them. And so he called the prophet Hosea to live out in his own life and to intensely feel in his own heart the great love that God has for his people and the heartache that God may be said to experience whenever his people turn away from him through their sins. Hosea, in other words, was called to be a living sign in the world of God's unconditional love for his people. Tomorrow, the church celebrates the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. You know, I've always had a great love for this particular feast, but I've never really taken the time to ponder why that really is the case. In fact, to be very honest with you, it wasn't until I was preparing for this talk and I began to hit a roadblock, basically not knowing what exactly I was going to say and, and turning to the Lord and saying, Lord, I, I've come up with this idea, but I don't know where to go with it, that it came to me, reflect on why you love the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And I began to do that. And I'll, I'll share with you what the Lord showed me, but I have to warn you, although I'm a theologian and I teach here at the seminary, what I'm about to share is not going to be all that profoundly theological. The honest truth is very simple. Whenever I think about the Sacred Heart of Jesus, whenever I look at an image of the Sacred Heart, whenever I reflect on the readings and prayers that the church gives us for the feast day that we will celebrate tomorrow, there's something that just feels very good within me as I do so. I feel consoled. I feel cared for. I feel that I am loved. And that, I came to realize, is why the meaning and the message of the Sacred Heart devotion is so important, not only to me, but to every human being on the face of the earth. For every single one of us, whether we realize it or not, every single one of us has an innate desire 
to be loved unconditionally. We want to know that at the end of the day, despite our faults, despite our failings, despite our shortcomings, there is someone who will always love us with no strings attached. We seek that unconditional love in all of our most intimate human relationships, especially in marriage and family life. But the reality is that no human being, no husband, no wife, no son, no daughter, no best friend, no sibling, no human being is capable of a completely unconditional, no strings attached love for another human being. It is only in God, whose love is made visible and tangible for us in the heart of his beloved Son, that we can find the love that will truly satisfy us. So in preparation for our celebration of the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart, I want to look briefly at some examples of how God in Scripture demonstrates his unmerited and unconditional love. Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus really formally springs from the visions of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in the 17th century, but its roots extend much, much farther back into salvation history, in fact, into the writings of the Old Testament. Yes, the love of God revealed for us in our Lord's Sacred Heart extends all the way back to the very beginnings of the Old Testament. Now, sometimes when I say things like that, some folks are surprised. Wait a minute, God's unconditional love is found in the Old Testament? I always thought the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath, a God who likes to send plague and pestilence on everyone whenever they slightly displease him. Well, that unfortunately is the popular impression that many people have of the Old Testament but I cannot emphasize enough how false that impression is. Yes, it is true, there are many occasions in the Old Testament where we find God administering judgment and justice when people sin against him. But to hold, as some people do, that the Old Testament reveals a different God than the one revealed by Jesus in the New, or that God somehow changed over time, well, that is simply heretical. God doesn't change. It's not like, you know, it's not like we say, well, you know, our Lord, he used to be pretty hot-headed when he was younger, uh, but by the first century AD, he mellowed out a lot. He even sent his son into the world to uh, show us uh, how much he really loves us. Well, no, that's, that's simply wrong. The truth is, from the very beginning, God shows his profound love for us. He shows his love for us in creation. He shows his love in a very tender way, going all the way back to the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, when, when God expels Adam and Eve from the garden, we are told that God makes garments for them. He continues to care for his beloved children, even when they have turned away from him. And the whole story of Israel in the Old Testament is a story of how God over and over again shows his love for his chosen people even when they are unfaithful. Tomorrow's first reading at Mass for the celebration of the Sacred Heart is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. And in that reading, which I've included on your handout, Moses says to the people of Israel, you are a people sacred to the Lord your God. He has chosen you from all the nations on the face of the earth to be a people peculiarly his own. And then Moses said, it was not because you are the largest of all nations that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you are really the smallest of all nations. In other words, it was nothing Israel had done, nothing about Israel in particular that made God look down and say, wow, this is a really great people. I'm going to love them in a special way. No, God's love was gratuitous. It came first. Moses says, it was because the Lord loved you that he brought you out with his strong hand from the place of slavery 
and ransomed you from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. That will be our reading at Mass tomorrow. And then just two days later, on Sunday, we will hear a reading from the book of Exodus, in which God says to the people of Israel, you have seen for yourselves how I treated the Egyptians, how I bore you up on eagle wings and brought you here to myself. Therefore, if you hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my special possession, dearer to me than all other people, though all the earth is mine. In fact, over and over again in the pages of the Old Testament, we find evidence of God's unconditional and unfailing love for his people. To cite one example, we're probably all familiar with the story of the golden calf in the book of Exodus. Just to recap, however, the book of Exodus, of course, tells us the story of how God liberates the Israelites when they are enslaved in Egypt. He takes pity on them, and in his merciful love, he leads them out of slavery and brings them to Mount Sinai, where he makes a covenant with them. This covenant, in many ways, as the later prophets like Hosea will intuit, this covenant is like a marriage. It's as if the people of Israel are marrying Yahweh their God. Moses leads them in a covenant ratification ceremony. Then he goes up Mount Sinai to, to be with the Lord. And as we all know, as Moses is up on Mount Sinai, what are the Israelites doing? They're down below and they're getting frustrated. And they ask Aaron, Moses' brother, make us a golden calf so that we have something to worship. Aaron does it, they worship it, and both Moses and the Lord get pretty angry about that, and rightly so because this is the equivalent of someone getting married and then committing adultery on their honeymoon. The Israelites have just entered into a relationship with God and they're being unfaithful. As I said, both Moses and the Lord himself are displeased by this. But ultimately, God reveals his merciful love towards this unfaithful people. In Exodus 34, just two chapters after the golden calf incident, God describes himself in these words, the Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love and fidelity, continuing his love for a thousand generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. It's interesting, although some Christians today think of the God of the Old Testament as a God of wrath, the ancient Israelites did not perceive him in this way at all. In the book of Jonah, we have a rather delightfully humorous story in which God calls this man named Jonah to go to a foreign land, the land of Nineveh, and to preach repentance to the people there. The people of Nineveh were one of the ancient enemies of Israel, and Jonah, very frankly, did not want to see them experiencing divine mercy. So what does Jonah do? He decides to go in the opposite direction. Nineveh is off to the east. Jonah sets sail in a ship for the west to Tarshish. He's getting as far away as possible from where God wants him to go. And it is only when Jonah ends up being thrown overboard from his ship and swallowed by a giant fish that he has a little rethink and, and decides, well, yeah, I guess going to Nineveh is better than being digested by a giant fish. So he goes, he preaches repentance to the Ninevites, and when the people actually repent, Jonah is angry. He goes outside the city and he pouts like a little four-year-old. When God then challenges him on this point, what does Jonah say? Well, he somewhat reproachfully describes God's love and mercy in terms that are very similar to how God describes himself in Exodus 34. Jonah says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled at first toward Tarshish. 
I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, repenting of punishment. So now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. Uh, he'd rather die than see other people experience God's mercy. But the interesting thing here is, Jonah says, I knew that you were a merciful and gracious God. Interestingly also, in the translation that I've given you of Jonah's words, he describes God as abounding in kindness. Now the word that is translated in this passage as kindness in Hebrew is the word hesed. If you want to pronounce it really accurately, you would do a gargling sound in your throat when you, when you say the H, it, it's chesed, but I'll spare you uh, hearing that over and over again, so I'll just say hesed. This is a very beautiful word. It occurs 246 times in the Old Testament, and sometimes it is used to describe how we human beings relate to one another, but most of the time, it refers to how God deals with us as individuals, the people of Israel, and humanity as a whole. Chesed is very difficult to translate into English using simply one word. Many Bibles render it as love, or mercy, or kindness, and all three of these words capture something of what chesed is all about. A better way to translate it would be steadfast love or faithful love. Hesed refers to God's covenant love for his people, a love which endures despite our weakness and our sinfulness. It is a love that God extends to us even when we are indifferent to him or far away from him. The last time I was here speaking with you, I spoke about the book of Ruth. If you were here for that talk, the book of Ruth offers a beautiful human depiction of what God's chesed, his faithful love, looks like when it depicts Ruth, who is very faithful to her mother-in-law, Naomi, following her from the land of Moab back to the land of Israel, even though Naomi is utterly indifferent to her daughter-in-law and really doesn't care if she comes with her or not. But Ruth continues to love her mother-in-law and to be faithful to her, and ultimately, that love and fidelity brings about her mother Naomi's salvation and well-being. This is the unconditional love that God has for us. It is beautifully depicted so many times in the Bible. I'm just going to mention a couple more instances. In Isaiah chapter 49, the context for which is the Babylonian exile, the Jewish people have been taken away from their land and are living in exile in Babylon, and they believe that they have been abandoned and rejected by God. In response, God says to them through his prophet, can a mother forget her infant, be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget you. The bond of love between God and us is stronger even than the bond a mother shares with her child. God tells us that if even our own mother were to reject us, God will never do the same. I could go on and on, but I'm aware that we only have so much time, so I'm going to limit myself to those observations. But I've really just scratched the surface of the number of times in the Old Testament when we encounter instances of God's faithful love for his people. In addition to this, throughout the Old Testament, we find continual references to God's heart a heart which burns with love for us, but is also grieved and broken by human sin. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, right before God sends the flood on the earth, we read that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. 
in the book of Hosea, God, although the Israelites have disobeyed the covenant so many times, God says, Hosea 11 verse 8, my heart recoils within me, my compassion grows warm and tender. The heart, of course, literally speaking, is a vital physical organ which pumps blood to the rest of the organs in our body. In a symbolic sense, however, the heart represents our emotions and our attitudes. It symbolizes everything that is most personal and intimate within us. The heart is the spiritual center of our souls, the center of all our emotional and intellectual activity. God, of course, is pure spirit. God does not have an actual heart. So when we read references to God's heart in the Old Testament, we find ourselves in the realm of metaphor. The writers of scripture use the image of the heart to convey metaphorically a truth about God and how he relates to us. But here's the amazing thing. As Christians, we believe, of course, that this God who loves us so deeply and so unconditionally took on human flesh. 2,000 years ago in a small village called Nazareth in the region of Galilee in northern Israel, a young Jewish woman named Mary uttered her fiat in response to the angel Gabriel's announcement that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. And with her words, be it done unto me according to your word, the word of God became flesh in her womb and dwelt among us. And although our Lord and Savior was conceived miraculously without the involvement of a human father, we can probably assume that our Lord's neonatal development followed the typical stages of any unborn child. That being the case, at about three weeks into Mary's pregnancy, our Lord's heart would have begun to form and take shape in his tiny body. About a week later, our Lord's heart, his sacred heart, would have begun to beat for the first time. At that moment, what had previously been metaphor now became reality. God had a living, physical, beating heart, a heart that beat with love for us. Pope Pius XII, who wrote a beautiful encyclical letter on the Sacred Heart, Parietus Aquas, which I commend to you, uh, makes for beautiful spiritual reading, Pope Pius XII wrote this, There can be no doubt that Jesus Christ received a true body and had all the affections proper to the same, among which love surpassed all the rest. It is likewise beyond doubt that he was endowed with a physical heart like ours, for without this noblest part of the body, the ordinary emotions of human life are impossible. Therefore, the heart of Jesus Christ, hypostatically united to the divine person of the word, certainly beat with love and with all the other emotions. In this same encyclical, Pope Pius XII urges the faithful to meditate on how Christ's heart beat with love for us throughout his entire life, from his childhood at Nazareth, living with Mary and Joseph, and throughout his public life, in his apostolic journeys, in the working of his miracles, in his labors in which he experienced fatigue and hunger and thirst, in his long nights of prayer to his heavenly Father, and in his preaching and his parables, particularly, says Pope Pius, those dealing with mercy, the stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son. This coming Sunday, our gospel reading at Mass will give us a glimpse of that love with which Christ's heart beat for us when we hear these words of St. Matthew, at the sight of the crowds, 
Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. It was above all in his passion and death that Christ's heart was moved with emotion. Imagine the fear and anxiety with which his heart beat as he prayed in Gethsemane and anticipated the sufferings he would endure over the next night and day. Imagine the sorrow and hurt which our Lord felt in his heart as Judas, one of his closest friends, approached him and treacherously kissed him on the cheek. The hurt which he felt as the very people whom he came to save uttered lies against him, mocked him, spat upon him, and tortured him. And then, as Pope Pius XII writes, and when the divine Redeemer was hanging on the cross, he showed that his heart was moved by different emotions, burning love, desolation, longing desire, unruffled peace. As indicated by his words from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Pope Pius goes on to say, likewise, we ought to meditate most lovingly on the beating of his sacred heart, by which he seemed, as it were, to measure the time of his sojourn on earth until that final moment when, as the evangelists testify, crying out with a loud voice, it is finished, and bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Then it was that his heart ceased to beat and his sensible love was interrupted until the time when, triumphing over death, he rose from the tomb. On that dark Friday afternoon on the hill of Calvary, after his body was subjected to unspeakable torture and three excruciating hours of agony on the cross, our Lord's sacred heart ceased to beat. After that, St. John, in his gospel, recounts an amazing event for us. In John 19, verses 31 through 37, we read of how a soldier comes forward and pierces Jesus' side with a sword, and we are told blood and water flowed forth from his side. In that moment, when the soldier's lance pierced the side of Jesus, the heart of God literally broke for us. But the piercing of our Lord's sacred heart was not just a tragic conclusion to a senseless chain of barbaric events. Just as Jesus willingly handed himself over to us for our salvation, so too he allowed his heart to be pierced in this way so as to visibly demonstrate a further aspect of his love for us, that is, his desire to give us the sacraments which would bring us into intimate relationship with him. St. Thomas Aquinas, commenting on this moment, says, from the side of Christ there flowed water for cleansing, blood for redeeming. Hence, blood is associated with the sacrament of the Eucharist, water with the sacrament of baptism, which has its cleansing power by virtue of the blood of Christ. Likewise, St. John Chrysostom, in a text that I have for you in your handout, notes that this piercing of our Lord's side, in which blood and water flow from his heart, not only symbolizes the gifts of baptism and the Eucharist, but it also recalls the moment in the Garden of Eden when, as Adam was sleeping, God took from his side a rib and formed Eve. And St. John Chrysostom says, as God took a rib from Adam's side to fashion a woman, so Christ has given us blood and water from his side to form the church. At the beginning of this talk, I referenced the prophet Hosea, whose fidelity in marriage to a repeatedly unfaithful woman 
represented God's faithfulness to us despite our repeated sinfulness. Hosea was one of the first biblical writers to describe God's desire for a relationship with us in terms of marriage. And as the words of St. John Chrysostom indicate, God's plan all along from, from Adam to the time of Christ's death on the cross was to bring us into an intimate relationship with him which would be mirrored in the love and union between husband and wife. I, I noted earlier that all of us longs to be loved unconditionally. That desire for unconditional love is realized in our relationship with Jesus Christ, whose sacred heart, ever since he rose from the dead, beats anew at every moment and for all eternity with love for us. I will conclude my reflection by noting that it is not only unconditional love for which we all long, but union with our beloved. That union is made possible in the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament in which Christ gives us everything of himself, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is the sacrament, along with baptism, which was visibly symbolized in the piercing of our Lord's sacred heart. The next time we, might, we go to communion, we might reflect on how in this sacrament we are brought into union with the one who loves us so unconditionally. And we might pray in that moment of intimate communion with our Savior that we in turn might grow each day in our capacity to make a return to him of the love that he has shown for us that with the help of his grace, our hearts might be transformed a little more each day so that we can love our Lord as he loved us. As the final petition in the Litany of the Sacred Heart so beautifully states, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. Amen.